it might be a smart way to go about it because if someone likes you and even if you don't like them back, it's worth figuring out maybe what is it that they like about me? You know, if it's like they like the way that you look, okay, then I guess, you know, keep on keeping on. But if they really like something, I mean, if you ask them like, what do you think about me? And why do you like me? They might give you an answer of something that you never saw coming. And it might be an aspect of yourself that you don't even see in yourself or that you don't believe about yourself. Like for example, they might say like, um, I like you because, so good example. Um, when I was in school, someone told me they liked me because, and I asked why, and they said, because you're smart. And I thought that was funny. I told you I, I graduated with a 1.8 GPA. I was many things in school, but high grades was not one of them. And then she said, no, but you're real. Like, in other words, she, she noticed something in me that, that, that certainly my teachers didn't notice. Certainly other people didn't notice either. And she was like, but you read a lot. You're, you're thinking about things and all that. And I just thought, huh. And that was pretty cool because that means that someone saw a part of you that like, I didn't think anybody else saw. And you'd be surprised by what people can see in you. And sometimes, like I said, it'll be a thing that you never even saw in yourself. Like, um, let's say that you, I don't know. Let's say that you just have a heart for, for homeless people. Well, why? Because maybe you just, like, you know, you, you made eye contact with one one day and you realized, holy crap, that's a human being. And if that's a human being, then maybe that's reason enough for me to, to care about them. And then maybe, so, so then maybe one day you're with this person, you, and, or maybe you just walk out of 7-Eleven and you start talking to them. Maybe you don't even throw them money, but you just talk to them for a few minutes and you walk away and little did you know, Somebody was, somebody was watching and they saw that and they just thought, well, that's really interesting. That's a person who, who talks to people who most of us just ignore. And maybe that's why they like you because they think that you're interesting because you're a person who does things differently from, from everyone else. And so it, it, it's a good thing to kind of, to kind of figure out what it, that people, what it is that people see in you. Um, and by the way, that's positive and negative. It's a good idea also to pay attention to your enemies because your enemies, they don't like you for a reason. And it's worth knowing why they don't like you. And maybe after analyzing all of it, you're gonna realize, yeah, they're just a hater. <laughs> they really are just jealous, maybe. Or maybe there's something about you. Like, like last year, I remember this uh, student of mine came in, it was after lunch, and she, she told me that she was walking with her friend, and her friend asked her, what class do you have right now? And she says, oh, I have English. And he asked her, who do you have? And she said, Scanlon. He goes, oh, I, I hate that guy. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, what do I, what do, I do? I don't, I don't even force you to work. I, don't, I have almost no rules. I, and he, and he, so she asked, like, why, why do you hate him? And the guy said, I don't know. I just hate his face. There's something about it. Okay. Can I do anything about this face? No. You think I chose, does anybody think I chose this face? Yeah. I wouldn't have chosen this face if I, had, if I had a choice of faces. But sometimes it really is just that. There's just nothing that, you know, there's something that is just in your personality, there's nothing that you can change. Or maybe the thing is that they don't like you because they, they, they recognize something in you that your friends would never tell you because your friends don't wanna be rude to you. Or maybe your friends overlook it. Or maybe your friends just miss it. And so it's important to, to know what people think about it. We, we make this mistake today where we just say, you can't listen to what people say about you. You can't listen to what people think about you. But then how do you get feedback on what you're doing right, on what you're doing badly? And this is why, uh, like we know, a, a true friend will stab you in the front. Your enemies are the ones who stab you in the back. And so if your enemy is telling you straight out, here's why I don't like you, well, that's a person who's stabbing you in the front. And that might be somebody who's worth making peace with because they can t they're willing to tell you things that other people are not willing to tell you. And again, maybe it turns out that they just are jealous. Maybe it turns out that they, they just don't like your face and it's irrational. But it's worth finding out, perhaps. Okay, yeah. That's one of those, that's one of the big ones I hear from people. They want, they want somebody who's funny. And they want somebody who makes them feel safe. So you want a clown ninja. Um, okay. That's pretty yeah. And you want someone who's also smart. And you want somebody who, and so what you're looking for is you want a smart clown ninja. So you want a unicorn. Okay. Understood. Pretty rare. But now, but the, here's the thing now. You recognize now that that's what you want. So now what kind of a person do you think that you can make yourself into so that you can be, those, so that, you can be that as well? In other words, is there a way that you can make yourself a, a, a smart clown ninja? I mean, like, I feel like after being in a relationship with someone, you kind of start picking up 
fun and things they do. But like, I feel like if you fully have to like train yourself to be with somebody, then you probably shouldn't do that. Yeah. I was thinking about that for some reason earlier. Whenever I, I see people go through breakups and they, they'll post things where they'll, I was thinking of a friend of mine who recently was telling me, um, he goes, he goes to, my, to my gym and he's been gone for like a year. And then he showed up um, like, two, uh, like two weeks ago or so. He's like 20, 21 or something like that. And he shows up and he's just like, he's like I'm coming back. And I said, uh-huh. Because he's stopped by a few times and said, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. And I was like, yeah, okay, Andrew. I said, can't wait to see you. Uh-huh. None of us believe it. And then, but when he told me a couple weeks ago that he was coming back, I, I looked at him, I said, there's something about the way he said it that I knew he really was. And I just go, so you guys broke up, huh? And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> Cause that's the thing that was keeping him away from the gym. And then he said, yeah, and I need to be back in here cause I have to get back to who I was. And, and I hear that from, from people when they split up all the time. Like I gotta get back to who I was. I gotta go, I, I forgot who I was and I lost myself. Um, it's really common, man. And we start to almost like bend towards that person and become something else because of that emotional draw. And we try to make ourselves either into the ideal person for someone else. Um, and, we, and it isn't even necessarily something that we consciously do. But in, re, in, in retrospect, you might, you might notice it. And sometimes, and again, we, we treat like it's a terrible thing. We treat like it's a terrible thing because think about how it is that some people go back to who they used to be after a relationship. Maybe the person that you were with was someone who actually, in ways, made you better. And like I'm thinking of someone, I'm thinking of someone I knew, who she ha she was with somebody who actually made her better. And then after they split up, of course, you go through all the stereotypes, you know, changing the hair and. And like, yeah, I can't believe that, 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 you know, that that person changed me so much. And what he actually helped, he was a decent dude. And what he actually transformed her into, at least while she was with him, was a decent person as well. And then after they split up, I just couldn't talk to her anymore because she was so, like, unlike the perks. I, I knew them when, when I, knew him, I knew her through him when we became friends. But who, he, who she was when she was with him was, you know, totally decent, presentable, you know, a lot of really positive things. And as soon as they split, of course, the anger sets in and she just goes, she went in the complete opposite direction. And she was just not a person I ever would have been around if I, you know, before, that that's how she was the entire time. So sometimes it makes you worse. Hopefully it makes you better. And sometimes, again, like a person who we're with can help us to, to see what's possible about becoming better. Okay. Others? So the meaning of it is, is relatively straightforward, but the implication of it sucks. Because what doesn't engage our feelings doesn't long engage our thoughts either. Um, going back to this question about like, for example, should we help people who are, you know, should we help homeless people? It almost seems to suggest that unless you somehow care about them emotion, um, uh, unless you somehow care about them emotionally, you won't think about it for, for very long. And there are all kinds of like really big problems that, that if you, if you cared about them, you'd really engage, it would really engage your mind. So here's a silly example. You guys know what fracking is? Yeah. Fracking. Maybe, maybe you have heard of fracking at least. The one person who said yes didn't even raise your hand. Yeah, so it's like one person, maybe two people out of the whole class, three people. Um, in short, it's the process of, of extracting oil out of sand. Yeah, and, and you guys are really interested in this subject. And I know that you guys are interested in this subject because I had somebody from the school district who was writing a final exam like three years ago explain to me that this was a high interest subject and they wanted you guys to, to do something on, on, a, on a, a district final exam. And she was saying, this is something that students are really interested in. And, student, and, I, and I was like, are you crazy? Are you, are, you, are you higher than my third period class? How could you possibly think that the students are interested in this? And she's like, well, we find out. Who was interested in that subject? Her. Her, the person writing it. And then she superimposes it onto everybody else. And, she, and then she goes on to explain about how fracking has all of these like really significant environmental consequences and it has massive consequences on the price of oil. And, and, I, just, and I just listened to her and I said, so it's important to you and you're emotionally invested in that thing. Is it a significant issue? Yeah, intellectually. 
but you can't make something matter unless it actually matters to you. And then I remember she said something like, and she she laughed about it. And she's like, so what should we have them write about? Like social media, because to her that was stupid because she was like in her sixties or so, and she probably just figured out how to work work Facebook. So she kind of made fun of the idea that social media would be something that would be interesting. She's like, oh, they, they shouldn't care about that stuff. So it's like you deciding for other people what they should and shouldn't care about. How does that work out? Hmm? But the really hard, the really challenging thing here, if you do if you do that work, is to figure out. Like, what do you emotionally care about? And then figure out maybe why it is that you care about that. And the kinds of things that we might care about, I mean, sometimes it's embarrassing. You know, like, I'm really curious to know when the next Fallout game comes out. Every few months I check out to see, because I, I heard it's coming out, I heard that they're, that they're developing it. And then someone might come to me and go, Scanlon, you care about when the next Fallout game is coming out? Yeah, yeah, I do. But did you know about, I don't know, like some genocide in some like far off country that I've, you know that I, could, I couldn't even spell. Do you know about the about the, about the genocide in Swaziland? N no. And you're concerned about fallout. Yes, still even after this, because you can't give someone you can't make someone care about something, and you have to give people a reason to care about something. So, um, how about this? Um, uh, laugh. <laughs> That's terrible laughter. Why is it terrible laughter? Because it's forced. It's forced. Yeah, you can't you can't force someone to laugh. You have to give them a reason to laugh. And it's just like um, if you guys, if, if anybody in here is going through depression um, or you're, you're you're struggling with anxiety, I can give you some advice that will change your life. Stop being depressed, and then stop being anxious. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, and you can't just command somebody to, to, to be happy. You have to give them a reason to be happy. You can't just command someone to laugh. You have to give them a, a reason to laugh. And you can't just command people to care about things. They have to have a reason for it. And the reason that we typically care about things, interestingly enough, is the opposite of reason. It's, it's emotion. The things that we care about are the things that we're emotionally drawn to. Um, I was telling, I was telling uh, last year this story. When I was doing my, 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 my doctoral stuff, we had to take a class on neuropsychology. And in retrospect, I wish I had done neuropsychology. I really liked this class. Uh, anyway, the, uh, we, we watched a video of a, of a man. Is this from like the 90s or so? so it was an old video. And in short, he had, a, uh, he had a, an intense fever. He got really sick, his fever went through the roof, and it ended up frying part of his brain. And the part of his brain that it fried was the limbic system, which is what's responsible for your emotions. And this guy's limbic system got so fried that he literally had no emotions. So the video starts off with explaining his condition, and then they, he's sitting at a, at a table with his, with his wife. And she's showing him newspaper articles about the genocide in Rwanda, which happened. There's a movie about it called Hotel Rwanda, which is a, which is a pretty good movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's intense, man. Like almost, what, almost a million people, over a million people killed, and they didn't waste time with bullets. They used machetes to carry out this genocide. Yeah, so going down in his, in his videos of, of them executing it, just like grabbing people and just hacking them apart with machetes. And somebody, act, this guy who seems to have fostered it, who actually ordered you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of machetes to be delivered to the country. And he gave them out to, to his side and said, all right, go to it. Bought a radio station, he kind of fomented the whole thing. Probably won't surprise you to find out he never faced trial. But anyway, he um, he's being shown clippings of, of of the genocide and the, you know how many people are dying, and she asks him, "So how do you feel about this?" And he says, "Well, it's very sad." And she's like, "Do you feel sad?" And he said, "Well, it is sad, right?" He's having to ask because he really doesn't feel sad. Someone could walk up and shoot her in the head, and he wouldn't feel sad about that because he's not capable. Those, those, that, that wiring in his brain is just gone. And we might think like, wow, that's terrible. He can't feel emotions. Well, it gets worse than that. Um, she asks him if he's hungry and he had, it's breakfast time. And he said, you know, he, he couldn't discern if he was hungry or not because the, the feeling of hunger, the, the, the response to your hunger, it's not just biological, it turns out. It turns out you have to have a desire for self-preservation. You have to have a care about yourself in order to eat. This is why people who are depressed sometimes will just go like days and days and days without eating. 
You're not thinking about it because you don't care enough about yourself right now. And so he's unable to just say, yes, I'm hungry. Because that suggests that he has a desire, which is to eat. He can't feel that. So she just has to tell him at certain times every day, we're going to eat. And he's like, okay. So then it gets even worse. He's, she then sends him over to the cabinet and says, grab a cereal. He opens up the cabinet and there's, I think it's like four or five different breakfast cereals there. And then he stands in front of it. And then the bottom right hand corner, there's a time elapse you know, clock and 45 minutes goes by. He just stares at the cereal for 45 minutes. You just think about how it is you decide what to eat. You know? Uh, this, this one tastes good. You know, the, the desire to taste something good is an emotional desire. Oh, it doesn't even matter. That's frustration. That's, that's emotion. Every, this guy is incapable of making any decision. Even if you were to ask him to be a judge and just say, hey, be, there are these two, these two parties. Can you be a judge between these two parties? He can't even do that because a judge has to have an emotional desire for something called justice in order for them to even make a decision. So it turns out that, that most of the decisions that we make in our life, if not all of them, have at least a little bit of a, of a grounding or an origin in, in our emotions. So now you can start to figure out, this is why we, we intuitively said it, but we probably didn't understand what we meant by it, but you can tell what's important to a person by what's important to a person. In other words, if there's, if, think about the things in your life that you think are important. And then when you, if, if I were to ask you why, you might then go backwards and try to give some kind of an intellectual justification for it. Well, the reason it's important to you is probably because at the very basis it hits you at an emotional level. There's something about it that emotionally strikes you. You think about the people that you surround yourself with in life, going back to the idea of, of a person who likes you and you don't even know why. Why do you want to know? There's an emotional desire to know why because you want to either make yourself, you know, you want to do more of that or because we just like to feel important to a person because we want to feel like our lives matter. There are a lot of reasons, but they're probably not, it's probably not as much of an intellectual pursuit as we might think. Even mathematics, why is it that we go out into space? Because we want to see if we can have a desire to, to explore space, have a, have a desire to see more of the universe. So you can find out what's important to you by looking at your emotions. And then again, typically we can go backwards and it can be bolstered by your intellect. So now it begs that question of um, which one are you? Are you an emotional person or are you a logical person? Because we, like, we, we, we tend to separate it out that way. Are you, log are you logical or are you emotional? And the answer to that question hopefully is yes. <laughs> yes, because that's your nature. You have both of these natures. If you use your intellect to suppress your emotions, well, then you're suppressing half of who you are. If you use your emotions to suppress your intellect, by the way, also, you're using only half of what, you know, it's only half of what you are. This is why when we say things like, uh, I don't know, somebody said something that made me mad, so I punched him in the face. Yeah, that, that, that is your emotion acting out, but your intellect should temper that and say, if you punch people in the face, it makes things worse. So hopefully it's overcome by the intellect, which then puts a deeper desire on you, which is not make things worse. Um... Your emotions should tell you the things in life that you want. That tells you what's important to you. Your intellect is the thing that can figure out if you should want that, and it should figure out how it is that you get that thing. Like, I really want to be a, I don't know, a doctor, a surgeon. Okay, your intellect tells you how to figure out how to get that. Then your intellect might ask you, yeah, but why do you want to be a surgeon? Because I emotionally, I want to help people. I want to make the world a better place. Then hopefully your intellect then steps back in. Is there another job that you could do or another career path that you could go where you could help people make the world a better place? Then you might say, um, I don't know, I could be, I don't know. What else could you do that would make the world a better place and you could help people? You know, Maybe you say I could be a, a, I don't know, a politician. But then you realize, oh, and then your intellect steps in and says, but if you're a politician, you're probably gonna be compromised by, by, by campaign donors and by the need to get elected. So then you can take that one off of the list. But that's the thing, it's this interplay between emotion and intellect. And that's what you are, the whole of you. And so put them in their proper balance, use them for their, properly for how they're supposed to be used. And you'll probably figure out a lot of important things in life then. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticism, critiques? Neato. 
happy Wednesday. Yay. Easy Wednesday. Fair Wednesday. It's your birthday. Well, happy happy birthday. birthday.